Hi friends, this is John. I'm passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce food of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've been fortunate to meet many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems. However, much of this knowledge and information is scattered all over the place. I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agriculture systems become the mainstream globally, the status quo against which all other growing systems are compared. To achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or topics that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on social media or email me, john at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Be sure to sign up for our email list at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. Our community impact spot for this episode is No-Till on the Plains a nonprofit organization that provides education, networking, and inspiration for growers with a focus on soil health. Their annual winter conference is in Wichita, Kansas in January, where I will be presenting a workshop on regenerative agricultural systems. Here's Steve Swaffer describing the event. Founded in 1992, No-Till on the Plains is a nonprofit educational organization that provides information to farmers about adopting systems-based production methods. Our goal is to educate and demonstrate to producers the principles of soil health that create successful economic, environmental, and integrated crop and livestock production systems. Each year, No-Till on the Plains hosts summer and fall field days, local bus tours, and observations at demonstration plots across the Great Plains. These events showcase how individual farmers have tailored the application of soil health principles to the conditions on their farms. The culmination of the year is the annual No-Till on the Plains Winter Conference. In 2020, the two-day Soil Health Conference is being held in Wichita, Kansas, January 28th and 29th. Registration for the conference will open August 15th, 2019. See more information at www.notill.org. I hope you'll look into the work that No-Till on the Plains is doing and can attend their winter conference. I look forward to seeing you there. Hi friends, welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. I am very honored and excited to introduce you to Pierre Veil, who is a French agronomist who created a feed company in 1992 in French Brittany with the intention of producing health-oriented animal nutrition. And from the work that Pierre has done with growers throughout France, he then went on to co-found a nonprofit association called Blue Blanc Cour, which connects all of the actors involved in the food chain to help producers and consumers connect the dots between food and reducing disease and the quality of the production in the field. I've been really intrigued by the opportunities you have found to document the medicinal impact or the health impact of the quality that food produces. We speak a lot in the area of regenerative agriculture about how we can produce healthier, higher quality food for consumers. But I think one of the challenges is that there historically hasn't been very much research to make that claim. There are often missing dots in the research chain. So we may be able to identify that we can produce fruits and berries with a higher nutrient content, a higher phytoalexin content that we believe has a impact. And then in some cases, there is research that describes how some foods can have a nutritional value and medicinal value, such as blueberries and raspberries and so forth. But there often isn't research that connects the dots from the way the food was grown to the health impacts that it can have on people. And I think this is something that you have done. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you've done and what you learned? Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk about this. Maybe I can t tell some things that connect your interest for uh, a new agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and what we've done on, uh, on human health. We did uh, six clinical trials 
with human people and uh, some were healthy volunteers, some were diabetic people, obese volunteers, etc. But the, the common point that uh, in all the cases we had two groups, control group and the experimental group. And the people of each group ate exactly the same thing. Sometimes it's during two months, sometimes it's during four months, sometimes they are healthy, sometimes not. But in all the cases, they eat the same quantity of product. It's only the way the products are produced, the producer's behavior and not the consumer's behavior. That is the factor we try to measure. So we we did the proof of concept because it's, it's bigger than the... Uh, lipid nutrition or omega-3, omega-6 nutrition. But uh, omega-3, omega-6 nutrition is very interesting uh, proof of concept. On one hand, omega-6 and omega-3 drives all the inflammatory process. It's quite easy to measure in the, in the blood, uh, in the red blood cells, and also some parameters of inflammation. So we feed animals, cows, hens, pigs, etc., in a conventional way, which means uh, basically based on uh, corn and soybean, or we, we fed animals, the same animals, uh, to produce the same uh, eggs, milk, etc., uh, but in a different way, with first a variety of, of product of forages or seeds, and in these uh, forages of seeds, we want to, to reach an optimal ratio for uh, omega-6 on omega-3, which means more... Uh, grass for ruminant, more uh, flax for monogastric animal, etc., and uh, various uh, protein seeds. And after only two weeks, we can measure a change in the serum of the volunteers. They eat the same thing, but animals were fed differently, and we found a very significant difference, which means, for instance, this ratio omega-6 and omega-3, which is supposed to be healthy at a level of 5, and to be pro-inflammatory at a level of 10. It was 15 in the control group and only 5 in the experimental group. And the only thing that changed was the composition of the diet of the animals. So this was the proof of concept. There, there, there is a link between the way you feed the animals, the, the way you produce the food, and the human health. Uh, after, uh, there is, I think, a lot of things still to do in other fields that uh, inflammation and lipid nutrition, and, uh, other things like uh, antioxidant, etc., for fruits, for legumes, for grain, uh, a lot of things still to do. But we, we did the basic uh, proof of concept with these clinical trials that were published from 2002, the first one in uh, Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism. And um, the last one, the last trial, just a few words about it. It's, uh, I, I love the design of the trial. It's the, in the big hospital of the, the city near us in, in Brittany. Uh, it's pregnant women in two groups. So we'll have, like, uh, again, a Bleu Blanqueur uh, diet of animals or not. And we check the impact on the composition of the milk, of the breast milk of the mothers, but also the impact on the immunity of the of the children. So I have no results now, no data, but it was designed to prove that food chain, it, it's really the, the term chain is absolutely important. If feeding animals, if choosing the foragers can have an impact, not only on the quality of the breast milk, but also on the immunity of the baby. It will be something uh, tremendous, fantastic to prove uh, our responsibility at all the steps of the food chain, but it's also to prove that the, the farmer is the number one actor of uh, human health. The, the research you're conducting is exciting, and uh, I'm looking forward to those results because I think you are correct in that farmers, Growers, particularly of the food products that we consume directly, such as fruits and vegetables and animal products, they can have a bigger impact on our health than doctors and hospitals can because they have the capacity to prevent us from becoming ill. And I just wanted to clarify, you spoke about reducing inflammation, and inflammation is at the foundation of many of our degenerative illnesses that we have today that are just exploding within the population. So how much did you see inflammation decrease when you fed livestock a different diet and then people consumed those animal products? 
First of all, uh, in, inflammation is an absolutely natural process. The, the genes of uh, inflammation, the genes uh, provoke inflammation, are one of the big difference between uh, men and uh, the big apes, uh, our, our ancestors, <laughs> something like that. But it's it's really a difference because inflammation is is a way of uh, fighting against aggression all kind of aggression. But too much inflammation is not good because too much inflammation, our body is uh, attacking its own cells. So inflammation is, a, it's like oxidation. Oxidation, you you need oxidation to live, to have energy, etc. But too much peroxidation, that's not good because you have too much free radicals. Free radicals, it's a, a kind of weapon to fight against the aggressors. But too much free radicals, will damage your your body. And oxidation plus inflammation are naturally processed. But the balance between too much and not enough is very, very important. It must be... We adapted ourselves to our environment for a long, long time. Since maybe um, less than one century, we completely changed the ratio between pro-inflammatory process and anti-inflammatory process, and also the ratio between uh, pro-oxidation and anti-oxidation uh, process. So it's very important to, to understand that for me, uh, food food is not a medicine. Food will prevent, will uh, avoid any trouble in this inflammation and uh, peroxidation process. And uh, inflammation and oxidation are probably the, the, the mother diseases. All the, what we call civilization diseases, which means diabetes, obesity, cancer, even depression, and these new uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases, that the scientists call them uh, low-grade inflammation diseases. Low-grade inflammation disease, which means we, we live to have a good balance between pro-inflammation, omega-6, absolutely pro-inflammation. Omega-6 is mainly in seeds like uh, a corn, soybean, sunflower, etc. Or anti-inflammation uh, molecules like omega-3 that comes from grass, uh, from alfalfa, from clover, uh, and also from flax, which is a very original seed. <laughs> All the seeds are rich in omega-6. Only flax is rich in omega-3. Once you understand, we cannot synthesize ourselves omega-6 and omega-3. We must find it in, uh, in our plate and mainly in, uh, in animal products, fish and terrestrial uh, animals. So the balance between, for instance, uh, you know, grass and corn is also a balance between omega-6 and omega-3. And it's also a balance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory uh, processes. So we, we prevent, we don't heal. I think um, maybe we need uh, chemical drugs to, uh, when, when I'm sick, I, I can take uh, for a few days uh, aspirin, uh, something like that. But aspirin and most of the called blockbuster uh, drugs are anti-inflammatory drugs. So if we can uh, prevent in the fields, we'll not need to to buy and eat this uh, so much uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. If we can prevent the inflammation from occurring in the beginning from the foods that we eat, that certainly seems to be the way the system would be designed to work. We, we don't become ill because we have an aspirin deficiency, but because of the food choices that we make or because of other factors in the environment. Yeah, there is a, an American scientist. His name is William Lanz. William Lanz, I think he's 85 or something like that years old. He was the, the senior um, nutritionist of the NIH for a long time, National Institute for Health at Washington. Uh, I had the chance to, to meet him and discuss with, with him. And he, he, he wrote a book in 86, I think, or 83, something like that. The name of the book was uh, Omega-3 Fish, Omega-3 and Health or something like that. And in this book, he wrote, we have to change now in the fields. If we don't change in the fields now, we'll have to find a solution, a chemical solution in two decades. And he was describing the, the process of this uh, too simple uh, food chain we were building at this time with a lot of monoculture of uh, uh, 
uh, palm, corn, soybean, etc. We cannot say uh, corn or palm is good or no good, but if we we feed the soil, the animals, the people with the same uh, three or, or five uh, monoculture, it will not be good. And I, I love this sentence of Bill Lenz, who wrote, if we don't change in the fields, we'll have to find chemical solution in two decades. So the chemical may be not bad if I'm sick, but if I can prevent, it's like, a, 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 just add something um, I, I, very new for me, that I realized that I come from the animal nutrition. Then I got to, I went to soil nutrition, trying to develop uh, flax, lupin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then I go to human nutrition. And then I realized that all my life I fed the microbes, microbes of the rumen, microbe of the gut, microbe of the soils. And there is a link. There is a link between the, the soil, the man, the rumen, the gut, etc. Agronomists say a healthy soil will produce healthy plants. If, if men have a healthy body, they will not, uh, if they have healthy food, they will have healthy body. We have to, to prevent. The first uh, way of making people healthy is to, to prepare the soil. That's what I realize now. Pierre, you've mentioned so many different pieces that I want to unwrap. But before I lose sight of it, I want to go back and better understand the, how you began feeding livestock differently. Many of our listeners here on the podcast are producers and farmers. And I would like to better understand how did you begin feeding livestock differently? I think for the ruminant animals, it's fairly easy to understand that omega-3s are coming from grasses and forages that are not yet at the reproductive stage and that we need more of those in our diet. I guess one question is, are you an advocate for 100% grass-fed ruminant animals? And then the second question is, how did you begin incorporating other seeds into monogastric animal diets? How much is necessary? What are the parameters that you are looking for? Okay, first of all, uh, I think I answered the question by, uh, let's say, personal thoughts about my experience. I'm 65 now, and uh, when I began my career, I was an advisor in an animal nutrition company, and uh, I didn't like so much what uh, what I did in the, the end of the 80s because it, in France it was the period when we the diet of animals changed so much with the arrival of the of the corn in our field and also with the the end of the local protein seeds with a lot of soybean coming from uh, from Brazil mainly from uh, South America in, uh, in France and i had two two thoughts about it first it's maybe not good uh, my grandmother told me if you want to be healthy you have to, to eat a lot of things in uh, small quantities. And uh, if I feed animals only with uh, two seeds, ah, it will be difficult to, to be healthy. And, and I, I saw that from my eyes. I, I saw that the, the job I was doing uh, to be a nutritionist for animals is to, to make complex diet with a complex or not complex, but with a variety of uh, seeds, uh, cakes, etc. But at this time, things changed because the, the common diet with corn and soy was the cheaper one. And uh, my boss at this time asked me to say, okay, animals have uh, metabolic diseases, so we'll sell, we'll take the money from selling uh, additives, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, antiacidosis for the cow, or things like that. And uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And I wanted to go back to what I think is the real nutrition, is making nutrition from natural products that you prepare and you mix in, uh, in, in good quantities, etc. So, so I created this company with five, uh, five friends that had the same thoughts of, uh, about animal nutrition. We didn't like a chicken uh, eating so many antibiotics, a cow eating so, so, so many additives, etc. So we tried to go back to the, to the basis of, uh, of nutrition. And then we asked farmers in our area to produce for us a lupin seed, which is a local protein seed, to produce flax. And then when I discussed to the, the farmers, they said, well, when we sell flax or when we sell uh, lupin or horse bean, maybe we don't make the best margin uh, on, on only one year. 
But if we make the calculation on uh, two, three years, uh, maybe five years, it's good to have a longer rotation. I don't know if rotation is the good word. And when we produce wheat after one year of flax, we have a better yield. Uh, when we produce wheat after lupin or horse beet a uh, year, we have better better yield, but we have also less fertilizer, etc., etc. So this this idea of uh, balancing and uh, adding variety in the fields and in the diets came true with a lot of data. And so from this data, we experience that we, we have to go step by step and we ask for Bleu Blanqueur, for the, the annual producer, uh, to have a, a balance between omega-6 and omega-3 in the in the animal diet, which is depends if it's a hen or if it's a cow, but which is between 3 and 5, omega-6 and omega-3. The current diet are between uh, 12 and 20, sometimes more, sometimes 30. Uh, so the impact on the animal is very, is quite visible. Chicken, pigs, cows have also inflammatory diseases. F from this data, from this observation, uh, we wrote our specification, and mainly the specification uh, are based on the omega-6, omega-3 ratio on the diet. After every farmer can make his choice. If he's, a, as you said before, if, if he's a ruminant farmer, uh, at least large part of the year, the, the best source of omega-3 is grass. Uh, if you produce uh, eggs, for instance, the best source of omega-3 is, um, uh, is flax. And uh, depends also the variety of flax, the way you cook it, etc. But uh, it depends, and it's the, it's the farmer's choice. What we want is a, is a ratio. And a, a ratio, you can add more omega-3, but you can also have less omega-6. If you decrease, corn is a very good plant. Uh, soybean is a very good plant too. But uh, if you decrease uh, corn, if you decrease soybean, if you add more variety, it's also in, in our specification. We ask breeders to have, a, I don't remember exactly, but for instance, for laying hens, to have at least five or six different seeds in the diet, not only two. And this is important for us to, I can explain it later. It, it's okay, my answer? Yes, that was a great answer. Thank you. You mentioned that the economics of growing these high omega-3 seeds, such as flax and lupins and, uh, and other seeds that have more seed diversity in the diet, is while there aren't lower margins for that actual crop for the producers. There are ecosystem benefits where there is an advantage when you look at the entire crop rotation because of higher yields. Is there a similar economic benefit for the livestock production? When you feed more seeds, more diverse seeds and, and a different omega-3 to omega-6 ratio diet to poultry or pigs or dairy cows, what are the costs to the grower for that feed and what are the economic returns? Okay, the, the, the cost of the feed is higher, but I spoke of the human trials, but all, all together we, we publish in the scientific press something like uh, between 350 and 400 scientific peer reviews paper about the impact of this omega-6, omega-3 ratio on uh, various diseases in the animals, of the life expectancy of the cows, of the mortality in uh, chicken and, uh, and pigs, uh, also on fertility for cows and sows, etc. By the way, it's, it's one of the reasons the, of the environmental benefit because when you have less mortality, better fertility, more life expectancy, the environmental cost is de decreasing too. But it's not only environmental, it's of course also economical. If you raise a cow, uh, first you have a, a calf, then a heifer, and then you, you try to, to make, an you make an insemination. Sometimes it works, sometimes no. And the average number of lactation for a cow in France now, uh, I think it's around two lactation for each cow. When I was young, it was uh, we had cows for uh, <laughs> six or eight lactations sometimes. So it's, sometimes there is a, a pressure, a genetic pressure on selection. So you, you choose the, the cows you don't want to, to have in your herd. But sometimes you don't choose. You have problem of fertility, you have problem of diseases, of legs, etc. 
So this is uh, all the economy around this is also published in. Uh, I'm quite proud uh, <laughs> of this because it's uh, we call it meta analysis and epidemiolo- epidemiologic data. We did epidemiologic data on men. It's for instance, uh, the Japanese who eat a lot of omega three have a less cancer that. Uh, or less uh, cardiovascular diseases that uh, Europeans that eat uh, more omega-6, etc. It's, it's statistics. It's uh, statistics, but uh, with high level of uh, technicity, you, you can uh, you can find something, some data very interesting. So we, we did it with cows, about, uh, I don't know how many, a few thousand of, uh, of herds about France, that have this good ratio between omega-6 and omega-3, and we made all the correlation with the fertility, also with um, with diseases, also with the uh, with the heifers, with the yes, the daughters of the cows that ate a, a good diet or, or not, and we have fantastic results. It was published la- last year in the Journal of Dairy Science. It was the first time, so we have all this data, and if once you have the data. You can put economical uh, parameter uh, behind and see if it's economical or not. It's not. Uh, it's very uh, economical based uh, to to say there is a benefit, but it's more difficult to prove because it's long term study. But we, we we really did it. And secondly, the we developed quite well now the Bleu Blanqueur Association. And uh, the products uh, issued from these farms arrived on the market. It can be uh, seeds, but mo- in most of the case now it's animal products, butter, cheese, uh, ham, meat, eggs, etc. And of course the farmer receives premium for it. And this is a calculation. The, for, for instance, just give the, the data on, quickly on, on pig. We, we know that to, to feed the pig in this Bleu Blanqueur way, uh, with this omega-6, omega-3 ratio, the other cost is two euro per pig. And we we control the premium that is given to the farmer. This is also the role of the association. And the premium is four euro per pig. So if the cost is two and if the premium is four, you gain something. I'm very impressed with, with what you just said in, in two regards. One is... I'm surprised that the cost is not greater than two euros per pig. I, I was going to ask you for what is the bottom line for growers? Can they be more profitable? Can they be more successful? And that you have found a way to compensate growers for the additional quality that they are producing. So I have, again, two questions. The first is, uh, what what is the what are the bottom line economics for the livestock producers? Uh, are they able to be more profitable, or to at least be as profitable, even without the additional incentives that are provided from your association? And then I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about the scope of the work that you are doing with Blue Blancour and how that has impacted growers. Okay, so in, in terms of economics, I, I think there is a three way on return on investment. The, the first is the zootechnical benefits related to the, the kind of production. If it's a cow, you can have return on investment, on uh, fertility, on life expectancy, on diseases, etc. If it's a 40 days chicken, it will be more difficult to, to see something. Maybe a little less uh, antibiotics, maybe less mortality, but it's very difficult to, to prove. Um, but a- anyway, the, the zootechnical benefit does exist, quite proven, especially on fertility and for the animals who have a long life expectancy on uh, diseases and mortality. The, the, the second is the, the premium that the farmer receives uh, if they produce Bleu Blanqueur product. I will stay on the example for pigs, because in, in France today, 10% of all the, the French pigs uh, are produced with the Bleu Blanqueur specification. It's two and a half million of pigs every year, and it's, it's still growing. When I say it costs two euro and the premium is four, well, it can change depending on the price of the flax, the, the price of the soybean, the price of, of wheat, corn, etc. But it's between 2 and 2.5. Let, let, let's talk of 2. 
and it, it's not my uh, <laughs> my view. The in inside the association, the farmers, the people from animal nutrition, uh, the people from the public institute for uh, research on uh, on pigs, they, they meet every month, and every month they publish the overcost. This is the overcost. Then we go to the the slaughterhouse and the retailer, and we say. Okay, if, if the if the overcost is two euro, cannot give two euro for the farmer if he if he does the job, it's his job to produce healthy food. So he, he need to have a premium. So this farmer who sell uh, uh, this two and a half million of pig, uh, he, each one receives this uh, this premium, which is over the cost. Of course, it's, it, it's an average. Some farmers have very low uh, cost diet. And uh, the overcost is more expensive than two, but some are expensive diets. It's an average, but it's uh, that's the way we do to be sure. We call it an incentive. We say there is a, an overcost, and it must be an incentive. If the farmers are the first actor of a, a public health, uh, so they need to be paid for it if they do the things well. They they don't produce only pigs. Or meat, they also produce reduction of diseases, better health for the people, and they must be paid for it. So that's the, the way we do it. It's not on a daily basis. It's a who, it's a battle every day <laughs> because the retailer don't want to pay. But we, the farmers have the key. If if the consumer wants it, that's the job of the association. We we created the demand. We explain to the to the consumer, to the eater, that if they want to be healthy, they have to choose products that come from healthy farms, etc. And uh, if there is a demand, consumers will pay. And if they pay, there will be there will be a, a premium for an incentive for the for, for the farmers. By the way, if you realize that for euro, it's something like four point four dollars or something like that. For a pig of, uh, let's say, 100 kilo, to be simple, the overcost per kilo of, uh, of meat uh, is very low. Yeah, it's, it's four cent times per kilo. That's, that's, uh, it's almost nothing. There can't really be an argument that, that to say that this is too expensive to produce because there would not be significant additional costs when you look at the entire supply chain. That's a, another key key factors we, we realized for, uh, during this Bleu uh, Blanquer uh, 20 years uh, uh, process. Accessibility is the key. You can produce uh, fantastic things, but if you sell them only to the rich people uh, that will have uh, rich food, it has no meaning. So accessibility is really the key. People who are more exposed, have more risk, about these uh, civilization diseases are not the richer people. It, it, it's uh, the opposite. It's the poorer people. So accessibility was always the key, and we adapt the specification to have a major impact with the lower cost. This is really uh, <laughs> difficult engineering, but we did it like that. And more and more, now Bleu Blanc begins to be well known, and people accept to buy it. So we every year we meet with the, the people of the association, and we, we make the specification a little more uh, <laughs> tough. For instance, uh, things about not only omega-6, omega-3, but no palm, no imported uh, protein, no antibiotics, but all this has a cost. So we have to go step by step. And the, the final decision is the consumer ability to, to pay, but all the time we have the, the in in mind accessibility because if, if you want an impact on the boss side of the food chain and the eater side and the producer side you really need to to address everybody pierre i am very as i've said this several times i'm very intrigued and impressed by the scope of the work that you have accomplished in the last two decades and the the number of people that you're working with, the impact that you've had, and uh, the, the the conversations that you've had about improving quality and reducing disease in the human population. I think it's a very, very impressive story. And of course, the heart of the story is your organization, Blue Blanc Corps. Can you tell us a little bit about how the organization works? Uh, and when you pay a premium to growers for 
their production and the quality of their production, where does that premium come from? How is it funded? And how have you been able to connect all the dots? Okay. So um, uh, I talked previously of uh, how it started. So it, it, it started from uh, Valorex. And after Valorex uh, funded uh, with the National Research Institute and a public hospital, we funded the first clinical trial. Then when we get the results, it was a surprise. It was a very good surprise. But uh, you see that after only 15 days, we have such an impact of the way of feeding the animals and the composition of, of the serum and the red blood cells. It was really a surprise for me, for the, the scientists of the public health, for the physician. Everybody was surprised. So I go back to my, um, my friends, uh, shareholders of the Valorex company, uh, and I said, I'm optimistic. I, I think, I hope it will <laughs> remain my characteristic. They are, I'm optimistic because the, it's such a, a new field for agriculture, health-oriented agriculture. There is such a need in terms of civilization diseases that we cannot run this process inside a private company. So we decided to, to create a non-profitable association. It was in August, uh, well, today it's uh, maybe exactly 19 years ago. So we had a physician, we had consumers union, we had farmers, we had uh, breeders, we have processors and one retailer. And uh, all together we created the, the basis and the, the rules of an association. We were seven sectors. In the status, we have four sectors. One sector is one one person elected in the board and one voice at the election. And the majority was people from the upper food chain, which means the farmer, what we call the, 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 the grower, people who produce uh, flax, lupin, etc., uh, alpha, alpha. They had one voice. The, the breeders uh, had one voice. What we call the on-farm processors, it's also farmer, but produce a, a cheese or, or ham in the farm. They had one voice. And uh, the people from Animal Nutrition had one voice. F four people, and the other were people from the, the, the lower side of the food chain, which means retailer, processors, and consumer. So we, we had the power to say... Uh, will not put the, the Bleu Blanqueur brand on the products if the farmer don't receive a correct premium. After, it's uh, <laughs> I cannot tell, uh, after it's a daily basis to, to evaluate what is the cost, what is the premium, how to measure it, etc. But we really did like this. And today in the, in the association, we have three, three pillars. One is these uh, seven sectors, economical sector, uh, farmers, processors, retailers, consumers union. Uh, the second one is what we call the communities because health-oriented agriculture has to deal with all the actors of, uh, of food and consumption and health. And here we have four colleges, the physicians, they are uh, 1,600 now. So they elect two people to the board, the farmers individually. They also elect two people, uh, the chef, people from the restaurant, which is quite important in France. They also elect one people. And the, the last one, I don't remember now. Well, consumers, of course, consumers. Uh, so this is the second pillar, the communities. And the third pillar is the scientists. So the, the scientists are also members of the board. Some are elected and some are designated by the, the president of the National Research Institute for Agriculture. So the, the science, the community, and the economic. This is now the, the three pillars of the governance. And it's, uh, I think this is the, the key of the success. It's not a, a private owned brand. It's a brand that belongs to a non-profitable association and this non-profitable association um, managed, write the specification, and and it, to, to give an idea, now it's uh, uh, it, it's the major uh, quality uh, branch in uh, in France for animal products. It's ten percent of the pigs, six percent of the eggs, four percent of the milk, etc. It's bigger than uh, organic. O of course, we have links 
with the organic movement and some farmers are organic and blue blanker. Some are not. Majority is not organic, but some of them are. Because we have this culture of uh, obligation of results, uh, analysis of the product, not only obligation of means. Do you also measure the quality of the products that the farmers are actually producing? Are the omega-3 to omega-6 ratios of the eggs and the meat and the milk actually measured? Or do you only measure the inputs that are going onto the farms and that are being fed to the livestock? No, I, f I forgot. It's the, the most important thing. Thank you. <laughs> of course, we measure the quality of the eggs, the quality of the milk, etc. Uh, it, it's measured. We, we developed also quick spectrometric uh, way of measurement, but the key is the obligation of results. If you take uh, an egg in the market in, uh, in France, Even organic eggs, it's uh, organic soy and organic corn, but uh, most of the laying hens are, are fed this way. And uh, if you take an egg in a supermarket and go to analyze this, you will have a ratio between uh, omega-6 and omega-3 that will be between 20 and 30. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's really pro-inflammatory. Some uh, physicians write that uh, usual eggs are pro-inflammatory bombs. <laughs> and the uh, blue milk of eggs has a ratio below 5. If not, the company or the farmer uh, will have to either make some improvements, and if not, it will be excluded. Uh, of course, the, the, the measurement and the results is the key. This is the, the proof of concept. I think we'll, we'll continue and we'll grow in other sectors, at animal sectors, but uh, I'm so convinced that healthy soil produce healthy plants, healthy plants make healthy animals and healthy animals make healthy eggs, etc. That uh, we will measure... So, so Omega-3 was a very easy proof of concept because it's only plant uh, that synthesize uh, Omega-3, not animals. So if you analyze an egg, you really know the composition, the lipid composition of, a, of an egg or a milk or a meat is a kind of memory of his uh, way of production. You, you know what I have. It's like me when I make a, a, a blood sample and I, I analyze uh, glucose or cholesterol or triglyceride. And I go to my physician or say, Pierre, maybe you have eaten uh, too much sugar or too much uh, saturated fat or, <laughs> or so simply you ate too much. If you analyze, you know what you have eaten. That's the results of your diet. So of course we have the... The analysis and the measurement is really the basis of uh, blood blocker. That's that's imperative, and I'm I'm excited that you are doing that because yes, you you have to measure the the final result and the final outcome. So, and I, will, I think a new field uh, of research that you you started, and we we'll probably hope uh, do things together is on the fruits and vegetables, and uh, the quantity of. Uh, polyphenols, antioxidants, etc. Because this is the, the, second, uh, the second leg of, uh, of health, inflammation and oxidation. Maybe we'll prove together in the close future that uh, healthy soil will produce uh, vegetables and fruits with high level of um, antioxidant nutrients. And this is really beneficial. Uh, some... Uh, People buy uh, in, in in France buy uh, vegetables because the the government the, the, the state uh, say you have to, it, it's good to eat uh, from five to ten different uh, vegetables and fruits every day and this is because the the basis is the composition in antioxidant but the variation from uh, one tomato to another in a uh, lycopene or other uh, antioxidant nutrient. Dan told me yesterday I can go from uh, one to 100. So measurement must be the basis. And uh, inflammatory nutrients, pro-anti-inflammatory, pro-antioxidant uh, uh, nutrient are the, the key of health, but it's also a memory of the way of production. Pierre, one of the pieces that we haven't spoken about yet is how do you pay for the premiums? Where does where does the funding come from to compensate growers for the quality that they're producing? Well, when I spoke of the the battles on a daily basis, the, the association doesn't buy the product. We only uh, organize things. 
and we are, we have 20, 20 people working in the, in the Blue Blocker Association. We also need money for uh, communication, etc. Uh, and every time a, a, a farmer receives a premium, 10%, not the over cost, just the, uh, the incentive, 10% go to the association. But who's paying the premium? It's the, the company who buy the milk, who buy the, the eggs, who buy the, the meat. And where the money of the company comes from is from the retailer. So in the majority of the cases, we discuss with retailer, we discuss with uh, industry, uh, industry people, dairy, uh, eggs, etc. And they pay the farmer according to the premium we ask to, to give. Saying that, I'm talking like a book <laughs> in on a daily basis. It's uh, it's really complicated because, uh, but at the end, if the we we have the brand, and uh, if if the consumer want to buy a product with the brand, the the discussion are, are easier for us when you say you you have to to pay this. If not, you will not have the brand. It's uh, well, it's uh, it's the way we did, and it, it works. It works like this. Yeah, and I'm I'm very excited by the possibilities of also measuring the quality of the fruits and vegetables that are produced, and then compensating growers for quality because there we can have a tremendous antioxidant effect, and as you described, uh, also have significant health impacts. I believe for the entire community. One of the pieces that I've also been intrigued by is that you have found a way not only to measure and to compensate producers for quality, but also to compensate them for environmental services. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in this area and how that has evolved? So in, in this area, the, the proof of concept was about um, methane and dairy cows. If you want to know more about it, you can Google greener cow because greener cow on Google and you will find what we've done uh, 10 years ago with a stony field company in the environment. It's a very nice field. So the um, I said it's a proof of concept because the uh, it's so interesting that if, if you feed the cows with the omega-3, there is a biochemical process in the rumen they call hydrogenation and hyd- hydrogenation of uh, omega-3 produces some uh, molecules that inhibit the methane output, the methane synthesis in the, in the rumen. So this has an impact on, uh, on greenhouse gas and uh, global warming. So we measured that and with the National Research Institute. We, we had a patent and the way of measuring methane emissions through uh, analysis of the milk. And this was recognized by the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework for uh, Convention Against Climate Change, as uh, efficient and, uh, and true. So once you can measure, again, it's like for uh, nutrition, once, once you can measure, you can, uh, you can work to, to reduce the methane emission of the cow. So it's depending on various factors, but you can measure it. And uh, some farmers that uh, that feed the, the the cows this way are not in a, sell their milk to a, to a dairy company that is not involved in Blue Blanca. So I said, okay, we, we do nice things for health and the environment, but we are not paid for it. So the, the first uh, in, in the first period, we use the carbon compensation model. And they were, and we sell this carbon reduction uh, in the market. But it was not. It was interesting, but it's quite complicated. Uh, it's not um, if you're a small farmer and you make fantastic uh, efforts to reduce methane, and uh, you will not have a lot of tons of reduction because you don't have a lot of cows, etc., uh, etc. Et the, the principle of a carbon compensation they call it additionality. It means it's only reduction. So if, if you work very well before, you cannot reduce so much, etc. So we decided to, it, it took time. <laughs> the recognition by the UN, uh, United Nations was in 2012, and we only arrived with a solution two years ago. And the solution was to ask the, uh, the, the French uh, state 
to have a reduction in taxes for people, donators who give money as an incentive for the farmer. They don't buy the CO2 reduction. They just give a premium according to the, the number of ton and the, the importance of the reduction. So donators know it's, uh, it's banks, it's telephone, orange company like this, and it's also uh, public donators like uh, a city. Two, two cities, uh, area, uh, also sometimes, but at a less extent, uh, individual people. So this money is, is collected by the association, and then we give the money to the to the farmer according to the, the quantity and the importance of the of the methane emission reduction. So we we call it the payment for environmental service. Once again. You don't sell only milk uh, or fat or protein in milk, but if you do this way and you're a dairy farmer, you can also sell uh, environmental benefits. So this work quite at a small uh, scale. It's uh, it's only maybe 800 uh, farm, dairy farmers now. They don't receive huge amount of money. They, they receive uh, something like 1,000 1, euro per year or something like that. But it, uh, we start something. We start something. It's a, a direct relationship between the society and the farmer. Again, the, the farmer is the, the first actor of health. Is also the maybe not the first, but one, one of the major actors of environment. If he does things to solve uh, society's uh, problem, he must be paid for it. Or he must be encouraged at least for it, etc., etc. I believe it's a very exciting time to be in the farming world and to be a farmer, to be a producer. It's also a very challenging time, of course, very challenging for many growers from an economical perspective. And farmers do hold the solutions to carbon sequestration and to improving hydrology in the landscape, improving water, improving rainfall environments. We can have a tremendous impact on the environment as a whole. And I believe incentivizing that can certainly lead to faster results, the results that we're looking for collectively as a society. And this this also leads to a question that I have for you, Pierre, is how what is the role of what should the role of the producer be and what is the role of the producer in your organization generally and in taking responsibility for the shifts and the changes that they want to see happening well first of all the health and environment as you explained is a link between the society's demand and the farmer's responsibility uh, sometimes the, far, the society's demand is very heavy and it's uh, maybe too heavy for, uh, it, it's a pressure on the farmer. So in, in our association, if, if you come and see what what is a, a meeting of the board of the association, it's very, inter- very interesting. It's, uh, the consumer wants everything. They want uh, Farmers to produce uh, without chemicals, without GMO, uh, uh, good products, etc. And the farmers say, okay, well, I can't do that, but uh, I must be paid for it. So, as we said before, there are dif- different ways to, to have an economic revenue. Is first uh, return on investment from the technical point of view, but it, it's not enough compared to the, the very strong pressure from the society. So the, the role of the farmer is to, in our organization, in, the, in this board, in this government, is to explain things, is to listen and to explain. Um, in our society, I don't know how it is in the U.S., but in France, if you're a car producer, for instance, or a telephone producer, you're happy because nobody will explain you how to do. But if you're a farmer, everybody has an idea of how you must do the the, the job. And for us, the the role of the organization, it's the farmer in the organization, is to say, okay, um, tell me what you do, and I'll try to implement in in the ways that is interesting for you and me. But don't tell me how I must uh, cultivate my soil and how I must uh, feed my uh, my pig. So it's it's really interesting in terms of uh, sociology. So I, I say it in a, in a funny way, but uh, 
we do things in such a way that we can understand the society's demand, but we must be responsible of the way we answer to this demand in such a way that it's technically and economically feasible for the farmer. I think this is such an an important piece, and I'm very glad that I asked this question because you're you're absolutely correct. We have a similar situation here in the states and also in other countries around the world that we have worked in, where consumers do place very heavy very heavy demands on producers, and then don't really understand the costs that are associated with that. And it's it's unfortunate here in the U.S. we have had a cheap food policy for a number of decades now, and that has really had a significant impact, I believe, on the quality of the food supply chain, where uh, I know from personal observation experience that many growers, growers deliberately choose, or I shouldn't say many, but some growers deliberately choose to produce higher yields of lower quality fruit because that is what the market is willing to pay for. They could produce much higher quality and slightly lower yields, but there are not the economic incentives for them to do so. Yes, it's. Uh, I think it's it's important to say that like like this, we. I was not like this thirty years ago, but uh, I think the only process will be a step by step process. It's difficult to, in some um, consumers' view, they are good farmer and bad farmer. <laughs> Uh, organic are generally the good one and uh, the other conventional are the bad one. Uh, this is absolutely not the situation. Uh, and to, to change things, it, it will not... Uh, changing the way of, of production, uh, you cannot do it diving in a, in a new way uh, and completely forget what you, you did before. But it is a step-by-step -step process and this premium for healthy food, this premium for uh, environmental services are little tools to change things. But every farm is different, every soil is different, etc. So you you have to go step by step. And uh, I think w what we do is only to provide tools for a new model, the change from the the intensive way of production that was a uh, that's probably good reasons to exist. We didn't know what will be the negative impact of, uh, of the chemical agriculture a uh, couple of decades ago. But now we, we can see that the problem of the soils, the problem of an environment, etc. So we have to do it in another way. This is very personal, but uh, I really think if you want to, to do it at a large scale, and we need to do it at a large scale, we absolutely need to do it step by step, see a progress. It's able to measure it and then do another one, etc. <laughs> That's my my answer or my observation. Yeah, you've you've had a fascinating journey in the professional work that you've done. It's now been twenty years that you've engaged or nineteen years that you've engaged with this work on a very large scale within France. What are some of the highlights? What are some of the memorable moments that led you to where you are today and the work? What 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 produced some of the shifts for you in thinking? Well, the most memorable moment, of course, uh, John, is the, yesterday when I met you. <laughs> but there are some others. <laughs> no, I, 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 perhaps, <laughs> perhaps that's the most memorable because it's the most recent. <laughs> but uh, I doesn't know when I saw the first... Uh, <laughs> Well, the first clinical trial was such a, an important uh, moment because we... Now it's well admitted in the, the scientific communities. We've, I read a paper from American and New Zealander uh, scientists in, in health about don't say, uh, don't say animal products are good or bad. They are absolutely depending on the way of production. And uh, now it's well admitted. But at this time, it was uh, very new. Uh, you, you still uh, still read yesterday in the IPCC report that uh, animal production is a problem. Animal production is not a problem for environment, it, but the way <laughs> the way you produce and feed the animal is a problem or is a part of the solution. So the, these first clinical trials that we really proved that uh, you, you you cannot say. Uh, it's good or it's bad, but only it really depends on the way of production of the farmers' work, etc. 
uh, this was really fantastic. We, <laughs> by the way, it's, it's just uh, just funny, but uh, we did this trial in uh, twenty years ago, and uh, I, I was I was thinking of that yesterday because we were in New York and we was we were supposed to present the. The, the result at Health Congress in New York on September 11, 2001. So we didn't, <laughs> because as an event. But, uh, well, the first congresses where we present the results of this study were fantastic. And then, of course, the, the starting point of the association in August 2000, and then the first product with the brand in the supermarket. Uh, uh, yeah, it was very, very nice. And we had also good, uh, I forget all, all the bad uh, events, <laughs> all the bad moments we had also a lot of them. But the, the recognition with the Ministry of Agriculture, the recognition by the UNFCCC, these are also very memorable moments because we, we really started from nothing. So. <laughs> You certainly you had a lot of successes, and I congratulate you for that. What has been something that surprised you along the way? What was unexpected? Well, I will give uh, not a success, but something uh, sometimes unsuccessful. It's the, the the communication. The communication was uh, was very difficult to establish. Now we we succeed because we built communities. But we, we hope when we talk the story to, to the journalists that they will relay the information. Say, oh, fantastic, the way of production. But they didn't. They didn't because they are still, uh, they are in a, in a way of thinking of good, no good. And this uh, step-by-step uh, progress was difficult to, to take in consideration for, for them and their relationship with the... Uh, with the press was uh, it was not difficult but it was not as good as we as we believed and in terms of communication uh, at the beginning we talked to the to the consumers like we talked to scientists we spoke of uh, omega-3 of enzymes of things like that uh, and people don't uh, when you buy a cheese or a butter <laughs> You, you, you just buy food. You don't buy omega-3 or <laughs> alpha-linolenic acid or uh, polyphenols, etc. And then we change and we realize that the people and, and journalists like uh, easy-to-understand story. And this easy-to-understand story must be uh, true stories. That's our, uh, <laughs> uh, our believing. So... We really succeeded when we when we succeeded to tell the story in such a way that uh, what everybody understands that <laughs> when you talk to somebody you know healthy soil produce healthy plant healthy plants produce healthy animals healthy animals produce healthy eggs and healthy eggs produce healthy people everybody know yes I know it's evident but to prove it it's more difficult so we we realized that we really needed two different communication one for the scientists the physician etc they say okay it's serious you can go and another one to the consumer to the eater that say oh, okay we rebalance your food by the the, the farmers the producers uh, behavior responsibility and the, the best that's important for all of us the best people to talk to the to the consumer is probably the producer uh, the physician too people uh, have confidence in uh, they trust the, the the physician the health professional but they also have trust in uh, in the producer if the producer is part part of the success in communication is also the, the producer who talk to the to the consumer and we, we took a long time to understand this <laughs> Pierre, you've done innovative work looking at soil and plant health connections. And one of the questions that I really enjoy getting people's perspectives on is, what is something that you believe to be true about modern agriculture that is different from the mainstream view? I, I think it's, uh, I don't want to, to criticize everything in modern agriculture. Uh, we didn't know before, but when we see now the, what we've done to the soils, to what is issued from the soil, we must say we, we cannot continue like this. I think modern agriculture was based on very simple principle. Uh, uh, soil is a support. 
the plant will do the photosynthesize and will bring to the soil uh, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, and that's it. Uh, now we realize it's really, really more complex. The microbial life of the soil, uh, everything is depending from the, the life of the soil, especially fungus and microbes, etc. So we don't have to feed the plant with a chemical fertilizer. We have to, to feed the microbes with organic matters, with uh, oxygen sometimes, with water, etc. And this is the basis of the life of the soil. I'm, I'm not an expert, but when I see the, the results of a better rotation, uh, when we take more in consideration the, the cover crop, the no-till or, or small till, etc., um, I can see we can do tremendous progress keeping the what modern agriculture brought of the the best of what uh, modern agriculture brought to to us in terms of uh, yield security etc but with a very better comprehension of the what's happened in the life of the soil and things are moving with people like you and others in uh, Europe, but the uh, better understanding of the life of the soil is a key of the agriculture of tomorrow. You're far better a specialist <laughs> than, than I am to understand and to, to realize what are the, the key factors, the, uh, the missing trace elements, etc., to maximize the, the ability of a uh, of a soil to, to produce and, and to store more uh, carbon and for a plant uh, to transform more uh, energy from the sun and uh, chemical energy from the, through photosynthesis, etc. Uh, feeding uh, the plant, uh, but feeding also the microbes of the soil. And uh, it's a fantastic period with the, with the knowledge, with the sense of observation of people like you. Uh, I think we'll be able to to feed the population. It will be still uh, very technical, very, very difficult. But the, the challenges are, are so important that we, we cannot go on like we did before. And we really have to improve things in a, in a biological way. That's it. <laughs> when, I, when I spoke of uh, animal nutrition, there is a parallel when 30 years ago we did the cheapest diet and we realized there was a lot of technical problems, of health problems on animals, so we found uh, technical solutions. But we didn't think of the, the basis, which is uh, cultivating health. That will be the challenge for agriculture of tomorrow. I think it certainly is an exciting time because while we still do need more information and there is more research that needs to be done that that always remains the case regardless of where we are in our evolution and we do already have enough we have enough knowledge and enough information that we know how to implement regenerative systems and to produce healthy food that can prevent disease in people so i'm i'm very excited by the conversation that we have had Pierre, you've published, as you mentioned, hundreds of white papers, uh, and we will link to some of those that are relevant for growers and producers in our show notes. I'm sure that there is a tremendous body of work that you have participated in developing. In addition to that, what are some common uh, resources or books that you would recommend to growers? Well, most of the books I read are in French, sorry. <laughs> I, I published myself three books. One of them is uh, translated in English. But uh, I, I read a, a, an American book in English because it was not translated in French. Um, the name is um, Omnivore's Dilemma from Michael Pollan. You, you know this book? Yes, I do. And then you have written several books of your own, including one which has been translated into English with the title of Fat Planet, which uh, I would recommend and suggest to our listeners as well. Pierre, it's been a delight to have this conversation. I'm very interested and very excited about the work that you are doing in France, and uh, I am looking forward to the day when similar efforts develop and evolve to a comparative scale here in North America as what you've been able to achieve 
there in Europe. So thank you very much for this conversation. And I look forward to meeting with you and speaking with you again very soon. Thank you, Pierre. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.